I will share today some work which actually is uh, not really part of the work of me in Dallas, but mostly something which I do actually outside of my work hours. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so it's, it will be mostly on the network projects, which I did also with collaborators from uh, Ecole Polytechnique, from other places where I work with, with whom I work with. So with some collaborators from Germany, because I was doing my uh, PhD before in Humboldt University in theoretical physics. That was my background. Then, because I was very interested in diffusion systems and networks in general and topology, because I'm a mathematician by training, I moved more towards the area of how transport can happen on networks. And transportation systems of cities is a very nice example of this. So actually this one, it's actually example, it's a scheme of a secret closed city. Well, it's actually, so one of those uh, secret cities of USSR I was born in, where they were developing uh, some, well, I don't know who they were developing there. But the interesting thing is that uh, their transport in uh, what right uh, we're showing also, uh, Patrick, uh, happening on these systems, if you model uh, it from the perspective of a modeler of mathematician, Knowing the topology, you can find really interesting regimes on this um, uh, in this system. So that's actually my kind of background. So I come more from the opposite of agent-based models, where I try to find some weird regimes of this uh, there. So I'm really interested in random walks uh, and citizen science. This is why actually I was so happy to come here to work with you, uh, because citizen science is also fascinating because you can also do some uh, bottom-up projects. So some of them are like projects on networks and transport, uh, which I will briefly introduce you, but I will not go into details because I wanted to focus more on citizen science projects. Like this one, for example, if we were working on these historical digital maps of Dijon and Besançon with my colleagues from there, uh, where we were trying to see how city was developing. Was it more diverging more towards orthogonality of cities, like city becoming more like a grid? structure or more towards more uh, more natural cities. Uh, then we also worked on the um, uh, Königsberg city network, where we're trying to understand how actually if we would have some spreading process, which networks, which places in a network would be affected the most on the first. Uh, we also work on modeling how citizens participate in some projects in cities. If there is a core Right, so the cities, uh, citizens' participation in some cities, it's not organized through youth unions, it's very disorganized, right? So we worked with London, for example, with Muki Kate, who I will also mention later, uh, our collaborator, where she was very self emerging structures. So we were trying to understand um, how these structures and cities emerge. And this was a project which also is related to the exhibits which are happening now in Milan, in uh, Rome, and in Karlsruhe, exactly at this time, where we're collaborating with architects um, and with Sony Labs in uh, Rome, uh, who shared with us the data on mobility of citizens in Rome, where we're tracking which path of these citizens would be passing through green areas because there is a very known hypothesis which says that actually people don't go through the path which you, when you walk, which is the shortest, they go through the nicest path. And we're trying to test this also hypothesis with the data, which actually was kind of true for Rome, but of course there are many co-founders events because you don't go just because of that, right? You can go through the market and so on. I also worked on the kind of this perturbation spreading delay networks in Dejum. Uh, these are collaborators from Belgium because the data on train networks and delays in networks in Belgium was open. And we wanted to test whether diffusion models, which I worked on, of spreading delays would actually give good predictions. And we were surprised that actually for quite small time scales, so like two, three hours, diffusion models were predicting much better than other models, which were known kind of well. We didn't uh, compare it with agent-based models, but with other models, which were like complicated models. And it's interesting that some kind of coarse-grained models, they can actually sometimes predict better 
uh, some systems, right? Of course, in a short time scale, right? Because every training vision is too late, actually. <laughs> and uh, here uh, was, uh, of course, there are also some centers, which is actually the heaviest delay. They are not in Brussels, but in other systems because of the way how network is constructed. And yeah, so now actually we also collaborate one of their postdocs actually works now with the train company also trying to, <laughs> to do something with them. Uh, I also worked on the structural and temporal networks. I guess it was, I will actually more talk about the mathematical work in the conference, Vyazny, where we'll talk about first passage time properties on this, uh, how actually distributions of first passage time properties is uh, how we can analytically uh, predict it. Because first passage time processes, they are very important criteria for transportation efforts because this is exactly the first time you reach from home to your lab, right? So you're not interested sometimes in when on the average, right? So often we talk about average time we run multi carbon simulations, we are interested in average here. And actually with the Polytechnic uh, Condensed Matter Lab people, we were trying to develop a framework which would allow us analytically to estimate it. And of course, like it's Laplace domain, uh, uh, still like it's not very hard to develop it analytically, but we try to do it semi-analytically. So. <laughs> And we also work with City Hall of Paris now, uh, which is really uh, interesting project. Uh, again, like on the free time with, with data volunteers, where we analyze the um, problem of City Hall of Paris wanted to construct uh, parking places for bikes. And they tried to ask us actually to help them to locate these uh, stations. So knowing the, the data on that. Uh, so yeah, as you see that I'm really interested in how interconnected at topology and dynamics are. This is kind of more the questions of what I'm interested in. And for example, here is um, one of the models which, which we are running now, developed by Thomas Kupta and like, people in Paris are very interested in that. They are, what we are doing, we try to grow cities and to try to see how they will grow depending on different city parameters also. And then we introduce some new network measures to specifically on geometrical aspects on that. Um, and as I already mentioned, one project with architects, we were trying to use LiDAR sensors to sense uh, some city trees to also assess information about how people are in cities interacting with trees. Um, and this is also uh, one of the aspects of kind of citizen participation that we wanted to bring people the um, kind of new ways to see cities and pay attention to that. Yeah, like we're scanning our, all our friends who were uh, walking around the cities. <laughs> and um, yeah, that was a collaboration with, uh, with the Sony Labs and with Sorbonne University, which was aiming to more um, actually not just do research, but also sensibilization of how important cities are. And I wonder actually if there is also, because in Hanoi, I'm surprised how green the city is, uh, if there are any open data, because in Rome, every tree, for example, it was uh, digitalized. So, well, F, all, almost every. Uh, and actually sometimes these trees, which is more surprising, I was talking to some citizens who map like thousand trees, so they really have personal relations with trees. It's really impressive. They have communities uh, of this. Uh, and so, yeah. When I was first coming to this uh, science of cities, for me, of course, Jeffrey West was one of the key uh, person who introduced me. I didn't meet him from Santa Fe. Uh, so his book is great. It's highly criticized by economists. Like they really eat me when I show this uh, book to them. But at the same time, I like uh, the fact that they int he introduced pretty much, right, or like at least uh, wrote beautifully about complex systems where they can be used because what he was doing, he was comparing cities, structures. What is the difference between the organization of a city and a company, right? Or is, is it very different? And what he was showing that, for example, if you compare Hanoi and Huan, right, and problems which Hanoi and Huan is, his one of the hypotheses would be that there would be some kind of scaling depending on the number of population or city size, right? Of course, it will obviously depend on many other factors, but the principle is very simple here. And so, 
And so then the next question comes, okay, if we don't have a data, right, but we want to test some hypothesis about cities, what do we do, right? And here, uh, the, their uh, very known uh, citizen science uh, contributors, right, can help us. Uh, but the problem is that sometimes the citizen science data can be very dirty. It can have a lot of missing information. And like what's intelligent, how intelligent can be conclusions made out of data which has all the missing values. It's a big question. So that's why one of the uh, uh, citizen science uh, professor from UCL in London, when he came to OPI, he gave me this data about citizen science and everyone knows about citizen science, right? Is kind of, right? The citizen science is when citizens can participate in some projects which are already either running by citizens. So you can come, for example, to collect, I don't know, uh, something in the, in the forest. And it started from Leonardo da Vinci even before, right? Where citizens who don't have any affiliation to universities, they were doing science. And main question of how to use the citizen science comes from this question, like, you know, we were trying to navigate in India and people were telling us, no, you know, your map is wrong. And it's wrong not because the map is wrong, it's just because it changes, right? It's like we were not able to find a way. And I'm sure maybe it is the case in Hanoi. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, <laughs> Good child uh, at all wrote very nice uh, article a long time ago where he talks about, for example, mapping of, I think it was Calera in London, right, where they were mapping uh, positions of bad sources of water with uh, diseases, right? And it was done already at that time. People were realizing the power of kind of mapping of citizens using that, uh, doing that for maps. And of course, the plus also for that and minus. Plus and minus is that no PhD is needed. So you can empower lots of people, but at the same time, you need to control for uh, data quality. And it's very important. And here, for example, some examples of such high scale projects, some of them Mark mentioned already, which you can uh, find everywhere, right? Like open source projects, like OpenStreetMaps, the number of contributors exploded. And now, like Zoo Universe, where people map galaxies, is one million uh, opposite maps, it's even more, right? Uh, right now. So, the questions, of course, arrive, and of course, the Hamiltonian open street maps, right? That actually, where we discussed about it. So, there are lots of projects. So, the question says how you can use this data and also how to use it and how to make it good quality. And for the, with this, the nice thing which is exists right now and people try to define it is called extreme citizen science which if you see that basically what is citizen science is when you empower some people like PhDs, um, postgraduate, high school, basic school. So citizen scientists they empower everyone but probably not like non-literate for example people because you still need some skills for people like at least you can read. Uh, but extreme citizen science approach is that you empower everyone and you also tell them, no, you know, you can also participate in design of the study. You also can participate in uh, research questions. It's a bit similar to what Premis talked about in this kind of really uh, like, uh, yeah, like total uh, empowerment of uh, citizens so that they feel environment. But of course, then it comes also to the organization. So this is from the, the recent paper by Muki and collaborators on that. And characterization of citizen science, I did just this, this scheme just to show how you can also map, right? For example, you can characterize some citizen science projects by number of contributions and number of uh, online contributions. For example, Wikipedia would be somewhere there, right? There would be um, number of contributions that would be very different, right? Everyone contributes as much as they can. And then the, the online contributions would be, would be mostly here. OpenStreetMaps would be mostly on-site contributions, but there are some projects and it's very hard uh, to work with them. which don't have only online or on-site contributions like OpenStreetMaps or Wikipedia. And one of these projects is actually iNaturalist is called uh, which has people who are going with uh, in the city and they collect uh, photos of birds or of plants. And that was uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to also work with the data from them on the Anatolian citizen science community. 
uh, these people have two types of contributors. Those who are really lightweight, you know, if you just, I just, I just, sorry. <laughs> Uh, they are lightweight or heavyweight contributors. There are people who are contributing individually, and I wonder how is it, it could be it could be organized in Vietnam, because in Vietnam, what I understand is that there are some youth unions which are can empower uh, or could allow people a lot of people to contribute. What happens in Europe? Because I was analyzing this platform, my naturalists in Europe and the US, they don't have any kind of a structure, right? So anyone can register and anyone can participate. And heavyweight contributors, they are contributors who are collectively contribute to community management as well. So they become almost like what, uh, right, when we talk about uh, kind of separation of labor, they start to be organizers, local organizers of challenges. Because the main idea of a naturalist is to document, uh, to document uh, cities um, biodiversity, right, or loss of biodiversity and racist issues. And so the main theory, which actually comes from high term weights, it's a known uh, sociologist of uh, citizen science, was saying that if you want your community to sustain for a long time, you need both, you need lightweight and heavyweight contributors. You can't do just with heavyweight contributors who will be managing community. But you also can't do without individual contributors who will give you provide the data. And what is interesting is that community organization needs to have these latent ties, which become stronger and a critical mass of persistence internal long ties. So it's it's very nice, it's very interesting. And so the, the interesting thing about this community of naturalists is that they are really fascinating people, like some of them, they have thousands of contributions. During the year, so it means every day you need to map at least five. And uh, the data is open, everyone can contribute to that. And some of my students, they are now actually starting also to work on this data. And some of them, um, they actually also start to contribute in parallel. And what is interesting about this is that this community, right, some questions which arrive uh, arise from that is that this community is temporal. And they do what they call city nature challenge, which is that everyone comes and they map everyone. Uh, everyone is mapping a lot of biodiversity in the city, in the San Francisco, but we don't know just from spatial scrolling, right? Whether it really is a community because nobody knows um, how it grows. This community is actually, they are able to, what they do, what they can do in the, in the, uh, what the data is about when, for example, Jean, you go to the city, you map, for example, to see a beautiful bird, you map it, you say, okay, I think it's a, I don't know, like a peacock, right? And somebody says, okay, it says, oh no, it's not a peacock, it's actually this. So there is a data control, which is actually a very important point uh, of, of this uh, platform, and it can be also used and this way for other issues like air pollution and others. So there is a data validation and only after two people validated your data, so they identified, they can actually say that this is exactly like a people. So the validation is also like Yes, yeah, yeah. So some people are actually only identifying. Most of the time they really go, every time I identify, uh, I make a photo, in five minutes somebody says, no, it is not this. <laughs> But they have also an uh, AI system which helps you to identify, but it's very badly working actually for trees mm -hmm. because trees are hard to identify which is the species. So, but yeah. We never have questions of like validity of the. It's the there are, there are actually, there are even discussions like the forum discussions. Okay, I don't think it is a peacock, mm -hmm. but or especially for birds because there is a big bird roaches community. And for, I don't know how is it in Asia, but in Europe, for some reason, people, especially in the UK, there is a very strong community of people who want to map everything, really. And it's like... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, probably yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and here, because nobody really studied these communities, we were very interested in order to see not just how specially it grows, right? And people are, as I uh, said indeed, they're not just doing that uh, on, uh, on site. There are a lot of people who are just sitting in their job. They have, for example, boring things to do, and they go on those websites and they identify, right? And so when we saw that in uh, London, for example, in 2018, we had data and from 2000 till 2020 when COVID happened, we were a bit surprised that, okay, in 2020, when even though there was a COVID, there were a lot of identifications. But you see that just from spatial spreading, heterogeneity of spreading, it's very hard to identify what is exactly this community. So that's why we uh, went uh, to combination of methods, which are classification uh, of um, users' participation and networks methods in order to map a community or represent it as a, as a network structure. And so first thing which we did, we mapped all users into four different categories. It can be even uh, made now more with more features, which gave us the fact that actually many people, they are identifiers more than observers, or some people do both. And then afterwards, we also were able to construct a network of uh, people who are contributing, right? So because every year there are a lot of new users who come, some people stay for long years, but some people are going away, right? So our question of course also was not just how community network wise, how does it look like, but also how, how sustainable it is, right? Because citizen science projects, they usually have no, no funding, nobody is getting paid, right? So it's very self-sustained. In this event, there is possibility, but we don't know about this, that people who meet online uh, or on site, right? But we don't know about that. What we know is how they identify each other's, uh, uh, each other's identifications and observations. And so from this, we constructed network where each node is a user. So this one is a high activity user. And there are some people who are just identifying and there are people who are just observing, right? And you see that there is a very clear kind of periphery of a network. So there is a core of a network, but there is also a periphery. And it consists, the core consists mostly of a high activity users who are connecting different uh, people of different colors. But of course, those users, and this is also another thing which you typically do when you do network analysis of some communities, right? What would you ask? You would ask, is it correlated the fact that a person is high activity user and that it has also in Facebook, it would be a person who is, for example, a high um, <coughs> connector, right? Who has many friends. And these persons, the people who are doing also a lot of connectivity and they are uh, high activity users, it's natural that they would also be uh, also very much connected, right? And large variance in how connected and how central users are in networks is similar to other social networks. So this is actually something which is a prominent feature in general of, of, of social networks. I don't know how much time I have because it's, I, I wanted more to give you an overview of this project because I know that, yeah. <laughs> no, the second I would. <laughs> so you have 10 minutes? Yeah. No, because, yeah, I wanted more actually to discuss with you because these projects, it started from the idea that we would be observing this uh, dynamic and temporal network of users and we'll try also to communicate with the community of those people because this is very self-organized community. So we actually had Skype long Skype sessions with them to show them this network and try to see with them why some people were leaving. Because sometimes people who were leaving there were actually not low activity users, but high activity users, because sometimes maybe they don't have time anymore to contribute, right? And so this comes back to this question of lightweight and heavyweight contributors, which is that the lightweight contributors, they are usually those people who are not just people, who have light or a few contributions, they are also those people who are not connected to, uh, to the community. They have less ties, right, with community. And this is also something which uh, network analysis typically can bring to this data analysis, 
uh, right? And how I, uh, why I say that? Because not just because also I like networks, but also because um, this is additional property which you cannot see without really mapping a network, right? From people to projects or people to identifications and then projects with this pipe of that network. Uh, so this typically typical classification also is kind of can be enriched with network analysis, um, and so probably the, the one of the last questions which I wanted to discuss with you was that the dynamics or and topology of the network it is changing over time, right? So then the question of this type, right, where you have just non-network view on the system where each year you can have a community, can be also mapped to networks and you can actually visualize or construct right, a network for each year and see what is the core, right? Or which type of measures change with time. And of course, COVID year was very big hit on this community. It was a lot of people could not uh, go out from their, uh, their houses. Um, and some of these, um, uh, some of these network properties which were analyzed for, for example, normal years was different from the COVID years. So we were trying not to really focus because we didn't know the real reasons, right? So we need to test that. And what we saw also was that, for example, the, I don't know if you're familiar actually with network uh, measures, but basically when you are constructing network, um, a network, right? Like for example, here, you can uh, calculate or estimate network degree for each node, right? And you can um, plot then the degree distributions of these uh, networks. And what typically also you see that, of course, the, the highest degree of uh, higher creativity users is higher, but then it's also stays in kind of the case for low activity users. Then when we have uh, the COVID year, right? For example, so you see this kind of community, especially when you plot it, you see that it kind of shrinks, right? There also were much less people. But if you also see as a natural indicators of the community, right? This would be, for example, average degree evolution per year. It would also be uh, decaying while actually some other measures such as average between us centrality stays almost the same. So these indicators, actually, one of the reason why we look at them, they aim to help the community moderators also to just to have yet another view, right, on the community, how it evolves uh, in time. There are many network questions, of course, which stay because this network, maybe you know about it, it's a Karate Club a network, which was a very famous one where people identified that there was kind of a uh, a fight between inside the karate club and then the, this karate club split in two and uh, they could actually map it and there is now a lot of papers written about the center so our question would be also does it exist here right for example are there some kind of inner structures because here we usually see the one core but of course you also with some more community detection like Logan uh, algorithm for community detection could bring new insights so, yeah, I will finish on that because I wanted more to discuss or learn more about if you work on similar subjects. But we also have network seminar. You're very welcome to come. I know already came. <laughs> uh, we do it online also, often, so you're welcome to come and to write to us. Uh, yeah, there are some projects which we are working on, so you're welcome to, to join um, and to read. I didn't talk about transport and networks on random networks because there will more possibly maybe talk about small mathematical work, mm -hmm. uh, which we did uh, with collaborators uh, from the Polytechnic. But uh, yeah, okay. thanks a lot. Thank you very much.